five, four, three, two, one. Fred Colwell. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Fred, you're good to go. All right, here we go. So, uh, first of all, um, Professor Booth, I just want to, you know, just compliment uh, uh, Professor Booth for just his passion, you know. Um, I'm sorry, I had a, I wasn't sure I was going to talk tonight, yesterday. I think I had a heck of a cold or flu or something. But anyway, uh, what I love about Professor Booth is his passion, his enthusiasm, and uh, I love being around those kind of people. And so, you know, you're going to get a lot of takeaways from this class, but if I'm sitting in your seat today, one of the things I'd take away, I'd take away his enthusiasm and passion for people, and that will carry you a long ways in life, okay? Uh, and uh, Chris Booth uh, introduced our team, uh, but I'll just quickly run down like Clint Cooper uh, went through the uh, MRE program here, uh, worked for a while, then went through the MRE program, but now how long now? We're talking about that. It seems like yesterday, but huh? Nine years. How many? Nine years. Nine years out. Uh, that it started with us in an, in an, in an analyst role uh, has a, one of the best investment minds in the business, period. Uh, everybody I've met in real estate investment, that guy right there has probably at the top of the list in investment minds. Uh, and he uh, chose to live here in Bryant College Station, raised their family here, runs our office here, does a phenomenal job, can tell you everything that's going on in Bryant College Station, and uh, just really proud to call him a partner and just a great friend. Uh, Evan Hershey works in our marketing area, went to A&M undergrad, uh, decided to go back to grad school. She's been working up here with Clint in uh, really a utility player position, running all kinds of different things. When she gets out, then she'll go to work in our development area. And E uh, went to work straight out of the program here, the, pro the, ML, uh, the land development program, and she works right now kind of wearing a lot of hats, but in our investment area in particular doing analysis but she also is unique because she can do graphic stuff. And so we kind of have her do a lot of different things, one of which was do an analysis of all of your reports, by the way. And she did a phenomenal job. She's got a chart you got to see there. It's phenomenal. <laughs> she took all of your results and put them into this crazy chart, which is really cool. And then Susan can answer all your questions about the reality of the business. And I want to talk to you a little bit about it, but she can tell you about kind of the, the struggles and and the challenges and whatnot, and um, I tell you, uh, she was she doesn't ever go to these kind of things. But I, I was, you know, I, was, I said, "What are you doing all night?" She's like, I don't know why. I said, "Why don't you ride with me to the Bryant College Station and speak to the real estate class?" And I don't think you've ever done this actually, ever. So this is the first. Um, but um, the reality of this business is it is tough, and I will tell you that it's tough. And there are days that uh, you wonder how in the world you're going to make it through the next week and next month, and, and uh, Susan has been really that foundation for me, uh, being able to say, yeah, we can get through this, and encouragement. And that's one of the things I'll tell you in business in general. Have a group of people around you that believe in you and that will support you because the world will tell you you're not going to make it. Okay? The world is really good about telling you you don't have what it takes. You can't do that deal. I guarantee you the world, that guy that was up here with us, that goofy thing right along the beach, um, Everybody in that guy's life has told him he's an idiot. And yet he somehow has persevered and said, no, I really, I mean, I'm going to go build stuff like this and do this stuff. The reason I raised my hand and said he would be great for real estate business, and I agree with what Dr. Booth said, is, you know, who, who wants that, right? But here's the thing about this. Let me tell you something about supply and demand. Because um, in the market, we tend to say, well, the market wants this. And what you have to be careful of is assume the market wants something because that's what's being supplied. <coughs> You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Walt Disney, one of my favorite heroes, Walt Disney didn't go at it that way. He didn't say, well, the market wants this because everybody's building this. Walt Disney said, I'm going to create this really cool place, and you're going to love it. And no one had ever seen it before. There was no consumer experience that said, well, we, we've got that down the street. Walt Disney said, I'm going to go build these places that combine theater and combine entertainment, I'm going to put them together. If you, get a, if you get a chance to read a book, it's called Blue Ocean Strategy, highly recommend it. Blue Ocean Strategy, it's written by two Harvard professors. One of the best reads out there in terms of being creative and creating unique offerings. Um, Circus Soleil, y'all been to Circus Soleil? Good example. Circus Soleil, they took theater, they took the circus, they combined them. Hugely profitable endeavor. They created a new offering, a blue ocean, as an example.
example, Starbucks. They took Exxon Tiger coffee that cost 50 cents, right, with no experience going in there with the guy behind the bars to buy the little coffee cup, and you, you know, you're afraid for your life. They took coffee, made an experience out of it, they charge you five dollars, and you smile. Hugely profitable, great company. So those are the kind of blue ocean strategies. Um, am I, do I click this thing? How do I? Yep. Um, is this here? I think there's a divvy. Yeah, it should be in talk to you about a couple different things and I'm going to go way off real estate and I'm going to come back to real estate, okay, and then we're going to come to your project. I've got some feedback, direct feedback, and we've, we've actually met a couple different times on your presentations as a team. i got different people in our company to go through your presentations. I went through all of them. I loved your introduction right there, remember? I went through and watched the video. James, right? Yeah. James. Jimmy. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we went through all those. But I want to start with this. Um, How well prepared are you to go out and do well when you leave here? Is a question I've got for you. Now, are you well prepared? And I was asking, um, you know, I asked E, and I asked uh, Miranda, who works in our shop today. I said, you know, how well prepared were you for the real world when you got out? And, and quite frankly, uh, you know, Miranda's comment was, ah, not so, not so much. And so, I want to talk about, kind of, give you three tools to think about in terms of being prepared. And I'm going to start with this because um, it's kind of the foundation for what I'm going to talk about. And that was a survey that was done a number of years ago. And it was given to people 90 years of age and older. 90 and older. Got it? And it was a real simple question. I'm tell them, mine. I'm going to take my coat off because it's warm in this place. Uh, the question was this. 90 and older, what would you have done differently in your life? Real simple. What would you do differently in your life? I'd give you a ticket. And you get school. Got it. All right. What would you do differently? And, and if you think about it, that's a great question to ask people that are 90 and older because they don't have much life left. Right? At 90, you kind of know. You got. You know, there are not too many pages left in the book. So you ask. They ask people at 90, what would you do different? And there were three primary answers that came out of all this research. And here are the answers. Number one, they wish they would have taken more risk in life. Number two, they wish they would have taken time during life to stop and assess where they were going. And then number three, they wish they'd left a greater legacy. So those three things. Wish I'd taken more risk. Wish I'd left a greater legacy. Wish I would have stopped during life to figure out where the heck I'm going and why I'm going there. Now here's the reason I tell you that. If you're like me, the one thing I don't want to do is get to the end of my life, whenever that might be, when the Lord calls me home, I don't know when that would be. It might be tomorrow. It might be driving home tonight. It might be 90 years old. The thing I don't want to say ever in my life is I wish I would have. So if, I, if they gave me that survey, the last thing I want to do is answer, I wish I would have done something significantly different. I don't want to be in that camp. So my challenge to you tonight, as we sit here, somebody hands you that survey right before you die, what would you have done differently? I hope you can answer it. So I wouldn't have done anything different. I'm really thankful for what's happened in my life. Maybe there's some small things, maybe there's this and that, but I generally wouldn't have changed the direction of where I ended up. So I want to address these three things, risk, okay? They said they wish they would have taken more risk. And here's what I want to tell you about the real estate business and risk, is the and risk in general, they didn't even write the real estate business. Risk, there's two things. There's perceived risk and actual risk. And I'll give you an example, a flying example. So, and um, I don't want to use my, I'll use my wife a little bit if you don't mind. Can I use you as an illustration? No, I like use my wife's illustration. Flying risk. So, on a perfectly pure bluebird day like we had today, competent pilot, well equipped airplane. <coughs> No mechanical anomalies whatsoever. Fuel in the tank, oil in the cylinders, etc. The actual risk of flying is how high? 
for a competent, qualified pilot to fly the airplane. That applies to every plane, by the way. It is exceedingly low. Less than the risk of driving your car across campus to a restaurant, realistically. Okay? But to someone who doesn't like to fly, by bride, what do you think the, per the perceived risk is? Really yeah. high, right? It's much higher than the actual risk. You get on a roller coaster and that sucker's flying around corners and whatnot. If you don't like roller coasters, number one, you might not like the, the feeling of it, but your perceived risk, quite frankly by design, right, the designers want your perceived risk to be really high, is different than the actual risk. And so here's my point. In life, people are going to tell you, just like I said about that guy that invented those, those <laughs> wood creatures, people in life are going to tell you the risk is here. And it's up to you to determine what the real risk is. And what I've found in my life is that once I determine that the risk is an acceptable level, then I'm going to act. And I don't care what other people say at that point. I tune them out. And I'm just like, we're going to go. Here's why. Because I believe there's an element of faith at some point in our lives on a reoccurring basis. At some point, you either stand behind the line and you say, well, I don't know what that'd be like. I've done my analysis, you know, we've run all the numbers, we've, we've, uh, we've done our market research, we, you know, we've done uh, consumer focus groups, we've done survey, we've done all this stuff. But on every project, there's going to come a point where you have to decide, am I going to step forward or not. And my point is, number one, do your homework. You know? Um, get wise counsel. I, I like something that says a wise man has many counsel. Get good, get good feedback. But at some point in life, you got to act. And to not act is to not have any faith. You see, the person without faith will not act. So I really believe that it's important to act, evaluate the risk, get good counsel and feedback, but at some point you got to pull the trigger and go. And we don't always know what will happen, do we? We don't always know, but the greatest adventure is in finding out. Town Lake, we started, I have no idea, really. I mean, we had a big idea, we built this big lake and all that stuff, and y'all have seen that. And Boardwalk's the same way, right now, right now, as I sit here today, I hope this is going to be on a film, I hate to say this, but I don't know. I think it's going to work pretty well. The numbers say it's going to work. You know, we're about 60% occupied, but you know what, old, old prices are down to $40, and you know, our, our users are signing up and whatnot, but I can't tell you for sure. I don't know for sure. But at some point, we said, you know what, this is, we've done our research, we've done our homework, and by gosh, we're going to move forward. Okay? Second part of it. So risk. By the way. Time to stop and think. Here's the deal. How many of you, I don't have mine, actually. That's weird. It's in my, it's in my deal. Uh, let me break phone. How many of you are without these? I mean, you put these things and get rid of these suckers for any amount of time. Anybody raise your hand? Yeah? Good for you. Discipline? Something you do regularly? Yeah. So my encouragement to you is this thing right here will kill you. It will kill your creative thought ability. As cool as it is to be connected to everybody, and I see everybody on these, and I'm on them all the time. My wife gets on me because I'm fortunate. I'm one of the people that you got to watch out for because I'm doing this stuff, you know, like I should uh, sometimes, not always. But um, this thing right here not only will kill you in a car crash, this thing will kill you creatively. This thing right here is just nothing but everybody's opinion. And, it's, and I've found in life that the biggest advancements come for me when I can turn all that stuff off. You know, here's a picture of a guy sitting on, you know, I love, I don't know if you, I, I love, I love outdoors. Now, I think, by the way, if you're a developer, that's probably part of something that probably is part of you. Uh, most developers like outdoor, the outdoor area. Uh, but getting away, and so my encouragement to you is to take time every 
uh, on a regular basis to stop and disconnect from all the noise. And man, yeah, your, your generation, you got more of it than any previous generation. You have more information, you have more relationships, more connections, and I don't know how the heck you get out of it other than if you're not, you need to be disciplined to get out of it. And here's, here's something I do, and I'm not saying you got to do this, but I'm just telling you what I do. So I do this couple things. One is, um, you know, I spend every morning alone. I get up real early every morning, and I spend that time alone, and I have a journal. So we gave all of you guys, by the way, a journal. That's what that is. It's a talent journal. But I do every morning. I write a journal every morning. Now, for me, I happen to be of a Christian faith. I pray and I read the Bible for me. And I write down what I feel like I'm hearing. And those become drivers for me. So I start every day not on a telephone and not on a computer. I don't want that nonsense in my ear. And I don't want it in my brain. Okay. The most powerful computer on the earth is right here. And we, you know, I think studies have shown we use like such a very small percentage of our brain. Very little. You know, I give this an opportunity to work. I, I start every morning that way. The other thing that I would tell you I do at the end of every year, I write down, I have it, I have a little red book. I've had it for 25 plus years now. I write down the results of the year. Most importantly, I write down uh, what didn't work. I write down all our failures. So it's a failure list every year. I go back, and then I go back through it every year. I've done it for 25 years. I go back through it. I look at what did we do wrong? What happened? What bad decisions did I make? What poor decisions? I like to tell you they don't repeat, but sometimes they did. But every year I do that. So it's taking time to stop. And then legacy. How do you live a great, leave a great legacy in life? And, um, there's, there's a lot of ways to leave a great legacy. You know, Disney, Walt Disney, um, left a legacy that impacts generations of families. How many of y'all been to Disneyland or Disney World now? Yeah. Who's not been to Disneyland or Disney World? Okay, so here's your homework. All of you did. Seriously, if you haven't been to Disneyland or Disney World, you get out of grad school, and you got a little money in your pocket, you get a job, you know, your friends are going to say you're crazy, but I want you to go to Disneyland or Disney World. Go to Disney World. Take it on as a project. Take a friend of yours and go to Disney World. Number one, you'll smile. But you'll see great development and great attention to detail. We've actually gone and looked at Disney stuff over and over and over because their stuff is so good. And the way they do things is, is, is just so well. It's just top of the pack in terms of development. Um, so legacy comes down to what you leave behind in places. And, and I'd say legacy more importantly does what you leave behind in terms of people. Now, I'm going to get real personal for you. You know, we built some really cool projects, Town Lake and, and Rock Creek, and we've developed stuff, all, a lot of different stuff that we're really proud of. Um, but the greatest legacy that I'll ever leave in my life are two daughters, Amanda and Lindsay. Those, that's the greatest legacy I'll ever leave. I could go build the greatest real estate stuff ever, and quite frankly, in... 25 years, no one will care who built Town Lake, and no one will know. That's the truth. I mean, I already see it in projects. I mean, we've got one that we live in, you know, that's been a top-rated community, et cetera, in, in the Houston region and whatnot. No one could care, no, who's developed that. I do. I care. No one else does. It's a legacy, really. In a way, it's a legacy because it brings people together. I get a great fulfillment out of that, by the way. So I, it is a legacy. But probably the greatest legacy that we're going to leave is going to be with our kids. So here's the thing I'm going to tell you. Don't put your work ahead of your kids and your family. And I'll tell you, this world tells you exactly the opposite. The world tells you that you need to be successful doing this, making a bunch of money, putting a bunch of stuff in the garage, etc., etc., etc. And your legacy, if you really think about it, ain't going to be how much stuff's in the garage. When you die, it ain't going with you. So, priority. Think about priority in life. Okay. All right, key findings. So we're going to jump into your, your, your deal. Um, love a lot. By the way, thank all of you for the time you put into this. Hard project or easy? 
Easy. <laughs> and, and by the way, um, I want you all to, we'll stop, ask questions, you want to kind of ask questions, we'll go along here, just raise your hand, okay, and you know, we'll go through this, but um, uh, E was nice enough, we kind of made a summary of some things, um, yeah, the demographic data, really good stuff, team one and three in particular, uh, good uh, summary, job right, income, age, marital status, education, by the way, we care about that stuff. You know, marketing cares about that stuff. Susan and her department and that whole marketing group, man, they care about that stuff. How many of you from our psychographics? Yeah? Got to know this stuff, right? It's cutting edge stuff. Uh, display of public art, uh, two and three. Ranked us low. We agree. Totally agree. We've got a bunch of public art that's coming in, but we're late to the game on some public art stuff, so two and three, totally agree. The attended school zones, team two, threats. Totally agree. Totally agree. Um, there's a threat, and how many know what we're talking about? Attendance zones, school attendance zones. Raise your hand if you know what that is. Seriously, raise your hand. Hi, hi. I can't. This didn't raise your hand. Yeah, raise your hand. You know what it is. Okay, there we go. So, as a as a land developer, school attendance zones really mean a lot because within your community, if you live in our community and you got little Johnny and Susie that you're raising to leave your great legacy with, you care where they go to school. What the school district changes the school attendance zones, and the great school that you bought the home, uh, that the home was going to go to, they changed the, school, the attendance zones, and now little Johnny and Susie are going to a bad school over here. So two and three, really uh, good feedback. Uh, schools, I'm uh, Long-term vision for um, having a call or up on the HOA. Uh, one of the hardest challenges, one of the biggest challenges for us, the state law in Texas says that when we sell, basically the rule is, when you sell the last lot, you have to be gone, Mr. Developer. I hate it. Because quite frankly, and this is going to sound very odd, but maybe not. Those developments are our art. They're our art. And man, you pour yourself into them. Like, no else. You know, Clint's got one we're trying to birth up here. We've been, what, just getting through entitlement now. Three years. Three years to get through entitlement college station. One of the most challenging places on earth. Um, <laughs> you care. But in our uh, state, says the developer, when you get done, you got to turn over the homeowners. The homeowners, they bought a house, they bought a, you know, bought a home in your community. They didn't design the waterfalls, they didn't design any of that stuff. They don't know why you put that boulder right there. They don't know why you created, you know, this particular area, why you have that landscape a certain way. So, Team 3, we totally agree this is a problem. We're trying to figure out ways to wire around it. It's a big issue in our industry, not just with us. Uh, economic, and I'm going to show you this. Competitor analysis scoring slide, Team 4, great job. Love it. Residential area trend slide, Team 3, great job. Volatility, Houston energy market, effect consumer spending, Team 6, we totally agree. It's a concern right now. Don't know how it's going to turn out. Don't know. Low potential for weekday afternoon foot traffic board work for the retail component. Team six. We totally agree. Big issue for boardwalk. Midday traffic. Um, driving traffic during the day to boardwalk is a big challenge and something we're very concerned about and we're very focused on. Price change. Uh, uh, per square foot price change. 07 to 14. Team five. Love it. Really good data. Uh, team four, I'm going to show y'all, and I, I, I don't know how much y'all paid attention, but we actually like this. I don't like the result. I don't necessarily agree with the result. But team seven, who's our team four? Who's on team four? Raise your hands. Team four, really like this. It's good communication. It's easy to understand. Um, not sure how you got this two on analytics. I'd be curious to know that. Uh, but uh, was that based on uh, value? Um, how easy it is to sell the stock ten over rate. Um, Appreciation in price, um, various factors, lenders <laughs> get to. Yeah, so yeah. you had your, and you know, we would sit down and have a conversation. We'd love to better understand how you ended up here. Um, obviously, we would think that Town Lake's much higher, but you know what? I love this uh, report. Well done. I don't know whose idea it was on your team. This is good work. Good work. Uh, what did I do? There we go. 
Uh, residential area trends like this graphic. Uh, which team is this? Team three. Team three, raise your hand. Team three. Yeah, good, good. Easy to understand. Uh, report uh, comparing the market, comparing what's on the market like the, like the graphic. Uh, environmental, residential, recycling, team one. Um, like the idea. The reality of it's a little kind of odd right now. Um, let me tell you, ask y'all something. Uh, does consumer care about recycling? No. No. Yes or no? No. Who thinks yes? It depends on Somebody did because y'all said we should be doing recycling. Who cares? Raise your hand. Why do they care? I only care if it's easy. Huh? If they don't have to do anything extra. Yeah, they would only care if it benefits them. Like financially or um, morally. Yeah. Consumers probably not. It's a good, let me ask you this: How well uh, educated is a consumer on the issue? Do yeah. y'all know? By the way, when you put your garbage in a recycling container, where where's it go? You might know. Sorting center. Doesn't it depend on where you're at? You know, there's been research done that shows these garbage companies take both trash cans and put it in the same dump. Sounds good, but is it really happening? If it goes in the same hole in the ground, the same dump, did you really, did we get what we wanted out of it? So um, we like the, this residential recycling idea and particularly the idea of educating our homeowners on how we can participate greater. So I, I thought whoever, that team, team one, we think this is a really cool idea. Um, and, and we all need to be better educated on it. Urban heat island effect. Team one and three both hit this. Um, we, we we didn't agree necessarily. Uh, one of the findings was we should have had more trees, etc. And you have to remember we started with the Katy Prairie. Uh, prairies don't have trees, so there were no trees on the land to speak of when we started where we met. There's actually it's much more forested today than it was when we started. Probably the tree counts. I don't know. 100x, maybe 200x from where we started. It was an absolute bear prairie. Uh, the other thing about the uh, the uh, urban heat effect is water, the impact of water on the heat index. It's, it's one of the best uh, ways to lower heat in a community. Susan and I actually live in one of our communities on water, and I can tell you that on our back porch is probably, it's significant, I can't take it in degrees, but it's significantly cooler. So, um, but we think this idea of really paying attention to that is important, uh, and particularly in this climate, it's really important. Uh, sensory, the uh, orthogonal, orthogonal, orthogonal buildings, tension in architecture. I put the tension in architecture in there. Who, who's that on Team One? Raise hand, Team One. There you go. Tension in architecture, and, and, and Jeffrey, uh, your professor, we talked about some of this too. Um, I tell you what we like about it. We agree it's not it is not harmonious, right? Uh, but there is architecture that causes you to go, right? And some of it's pretty you know well known stuff that causes you to go. Wait a minute, that doesn't quite fit the progression. Uh, we think we hope that that water tower feature is one of those features. But we agree with you that it's not in harmony with all the other stuff going on. Uh, shade areas, tree coverage, walkways, uh, covered walkways, stuff, great feedback. It's one of the things we've kind of sent out to our project manager, something we want to do. It was a reinforcement for us. Uh, more shaded areas on our walkways. Great, great feedback, team one and three. Add on opportunities and enhanced design. So, everywhere, signs, gates, docks, reinforce our brand. It's something we talk about a lot in the marketing department. But every time we do something, team three, can I mention this, we think it is a great point. Every time we do that. Okay, communication matters. Here's what we got. How much time do we have left? You've got about another 40 minutes. Oh, <laughs> good, cool. I'm going to slow it down then. Uh, but you only got another 15 minutes on the tape. Okay. Well, y'all, when we finish early, nobody's going to be upset. Right? <coughs> if you're like me when I was in school, just finish early. Uh, I have a real simple thing that I kind of think about a lot 
And I'm going to go to your pre Here's what I'm talking about in your presentation. So, not, and so Professor Booth may get upset at me, so I'm going to slide over here a little bit. Um, you had to meet a requirement, right, for your class. You had to produce a video and a PowerPoint. You had, to, you had to do the quadruple net, which I think is really cool. I really like. But here's what I'm going to tell you in business. Um, I believe this, and this is something that, that I say, is less said well can be much more effective than much said poorly. And here's what you'll find. You know, as we, as you are, I want to prepare you as you're going to move into the real world out there, okay? Uh, you've got to communicate uh, well. How many of you, how many of you want to be and consider yourself to be a salesperson? Raise your hand. Every salesperson, raise your hand. Raise your hand high. If you're still, okay. One, two, three, four, five. I want y'all to stand up. Okay. Now, I want y'all. I know it's going to be weird, but stand up for a minute. Um, let me ask you: What is sales? Somebody tell me what sales is. Give me a definition of sales. I would say being able to communicate an idea in your head and be able to have it arise in someone else's. Good. Present the features or attributes of a product. Yeah. Feature, feature benefit. Feature yeah, benefit. good, 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 uh, positive and negative. Yeah, it's proven the value that you see in something to someone else. It's proven the value you see in something to someone else. Yeah, I guess I'll make it. Fulfilling a need. Huh? Fulfilling a need. Fulfilling a need. Yes, ma'am. Building a relationship. Building a relationship. Wow. Huh? What else? Sales. Uh, transfer my belief. What you believe, getting them to somehow believe similarly, right? Yeah. Closing the deal. Closing the deal. <laughs> yeah, closing. Get them to take action. Yeah. Anything else? Convincing somebody. Convincing. Yeah. Communicating. Yeah. So, um, if I said to you that sales is influencing another person to make a decision in a positive way that you want them to go. Would you agree with that? So that's fair. Wouldn't that be sales? That's closing, right? I got them to move a direction I want them to go. That's sales, right? And I communicate in a positive way. I didn't threaten you. I didn't hold a gun to your head. I encouraged you to move in a way that I wanted you to go because I thought it would be best for you. How many of you would think that is really critical in business? Let me ask you this. I'm going to ask you a different question now. Y'all can sit down. How many of you want to be successful in business? Raise your hand. You want to be successful in business? How many of you don't want to be successful in business? Seriously. <laughs> How many of you went through this whole graduate program? Uh, oh, and are taught. <laughs> Uh, no, I mean, listen to me on this. And I'll tell you, I, we talk about real estate all day long, but I'm telling you, get this right here, because if I wish, there's some things I wish somebody would tell me when I was in grad school at Texas A&M. And this is the number one thing I wish somebody had told me. Of all things, and I'll tell you, I came out of grad school, and I was, um, uh, I was really good at numbers. Really good. I had an analytical background, and my mind analytically thinks that oh, that's easy for me. Analytics were easy. And I could run every number. But the weakest thing I had about me that I didn't understand, I didn't know how to get people to move along in the way that I might want them to go. So I struggled for a lot of years. Learning how to communicate effectively to get people to take action. And if you think, let me tell you something, if you think for a minute that your degree and your knowledge is going to make you successful, then I'll tell you you're mistaken. You are woefully mistaken. 
if you think for one minute that because you have a degree and you've got all this knowledge that now I'm going to be successful, you are incredibly mistaken. Because the only way that knowledge becomes effective is if you can communicate it in such a way that my friend here, if I can share some information with him, it might cause him to want to go with me over here. Well, now we've got a relationship, or a relationship. You know, you build a relationship, you get to know each other, and I get him to move with me. Now we've got something going on the right way. So my encouragement to you is this, is learn to be a salesperson. And, and I, I tell you, every class I ever speak to at a and I ask that question. And every graduate school, by the way, you, you're, every graduate class I've ever spoken to, I've asked that question. <coughs> and your class is exactly the same as every other one I've ever spoken to. And like three people raise their hands, so I want to be a silver person. And I'm like, man, you know, it's exactly the same place I was sitting because I would have never raised my hand. I'm like, oh my gosh, don't be great me with that nonsense. You kidding? Yeah, I've Undergraduate accounting degree, I have a master's in finance, I've worked for the best real estate finance professors that ever walked the planet. Don't degrade me with being a salesperson. So what I have to do the next 10 years learning to do. The thing that I thought was so beneath me, and, and for me, I had to just get smashed to the ground on my back in the business world before I learned that I had to communicate and build relationships with people and I couldn't just force my way into a deal. So my encouragement to you, learn to be a great salesperson. A lot of ways to do that, but first of all, you can read, actually study to be a salesperson. I know that may seem odd to you, but learn to be a great communicator. Start with the end of mind. So your presentations. Some of you, a few teams, did a great job with your clothes. The reality is, a lot of you spend a lot of time on the guts. Okay? It's like watching, these, these presentations ought to be like a movie. You built those movies, you made those movies. That ought to be leading. You ever go to a good movie that just stops? I mean, a good movie, a good drama, a good whatever, it always comes to a cool, the really good ones, to a cool close. So like Stephen Covey says, start with the end in mind. In business, let me tell you, there is nothing more important than the executive summary. Because the people you're trying to present to, and a lot of you are going to be presenting to executives, the executive does not have time to read all your stuff. You just don't have, there's just not enough bandwidth. I mean, I, you get, and, and, and um, the world I live in, I mean, I get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of emails a day. I, one person does nothing but answer email for me. Um, you just get covered up with stuff. And so to sit down, and unfortunately, I can tell you, the reality of my life is I don't have time to read a long report. I don't have time. I don't have the hours, the bandwidth. So somebody else has to do that. Um, but what I will read, and what I have time to read anymore, are well-written summaries and conclusions and recommendations and things like that. And I think that's going to be true in your life when you're presenting to people. Spend your time on the close. Value of the executive summary. How many of you wrote an executive summary in your report? It may not have been required, so I know I'm kind of way outside the bounds here. But write an executive summary. Tell me what your findings are on the front end. And then tell me what you found. And then tell me again what your findings are. Uh, image impacts your listener. I want to make that point is be, co be cognizant of who you're addressing and um, whether they're going to hear you or not based on how you look. I know that's really shallow and it's an unfortunate thing, but studies have shown that people evaluate people in the first 30 seconds. So I don't know you, but our brain is kind of programmed. We start making judgment quick. And that may be totally unfair, that may be discriminatory, it may be on and on and on and on, okay? But that doesn't matter. What you've got to do is be able to communicate in a way to get someone to take action on what you're trying to get them to take. You've got to bust through that. And so what I'm going to tell you is be sure you look the part. Don't, don't go to 
you know, a meeting in the company you're going to work for dressed in your shorts and tennis shoes, not that you would. But make sure you're prepared for what you're trying to do so that you will be respected in what you're trying to communicate. Um, sales communication, I don't know a successful developer. How many of you want to be developers? Wow, raise your hand high. Okay, so all of you that didn't raise your hands and say, I want to be a salesperson, I'll tell you this. In my history, I've been doing this for 30-something years. I don't know one that isn't a great communicator in their way. I know guys that can get up and do what I'm doing right now. They're real comfortable doing that. I know other guys that don't like to do this, but I'll tell you, one-on-one, -on -one, they're killers. I mean, they're just killers. Yeah. Their ability to build relationships one-on-one -on -one with a city official to a lender to an equity partner is beyond compare. I don't know any developer, period, in 30-something years of doing this, that's not a great communicator. Can I go backwards? Uh, effective uh, communication. Oh, yeah, we were just talking about communication. So that is why I like this one, too. This is Team 2. So on communication, I thought this was really a cool scoring system. Those, these kind of things are really effective. I like that, Team 2. I'll keep going back to that one. Uh, I like this one, Team 6. Where's Team 6? Yeah, I like this. SWOT analysis. Um, really like you did this. Good stuff. Team six conclusions. Um, you hit the, the four quadrants. What I would have liked to have seen, by the way, team six here. What do you think I would have liked to have seen? You didn't have to. And it is. After what you just heard me say. What's not there? You told you, you, you told us your findings, right? Here's some findings. Da, 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 da. Here's findings. What I would have liked to have seen recommendations. So if you're presenting, I'm just not going to real world now, it's in about your brain or whatnot. Real world. This is a great way to summarize. One of the best I saw. Okay, really a great way to summarize. You would have liked to have seen as, as someone that would have been reading your report on a project that you're working for us, I would have loved to have seen the word recommendations, one, two, three, under each one of these. One, two, three, one, two, three. Because then we'd have a real meaningful dialogue about, okay, here's what we found. Recommend, why do you find, you see what I'm saying? Team three, uh, and what right there, recommendations. You know, really good stuff. You know, push holistic design further, enhance sense of place, add all opportunities, uh, boating and water sports, when wider lake, fishing for transit south, encourage accessibility to bike lanes, and it's typically more tree, tree coverage, connect neighborhoods with grid pattern street. Um, delivery. Uh, team three, raise your hand. Team three. Yeah, really like that you went to recommendations. Uh, call it. If team three is one that talked about cul de sacs, like to see more grid. I think one of them on your deal. I saw that. There he is. This man. Talk to me about that. They got to defend your position. <laughs> so, I had to defend my position during class too. It's all right. Uh, I've got nothing against cold sex. So I think Dipto asked me about that as well and asked me what I, you know, what I had against cold sex. I guess uh, for me, I just think that uh, if you've designed a community that's connected by water, mm -hmm. uh, you're probably looking at alternative transportation. And one of the ways to maximize that, I think, would be to use more of a grid pattern. I think the reason that you use cold sex is so you can get more water frontage, which goes with the whole design of the, the community. But I do think that you lost out on connectability, I think that, or connectivity. Uh, if I was running errands in the neighborhood on a daily basis, Monday through Friday, I probably wouldn't have time to get on my bike or on foot and go over to Kroger's that way. Uh, but on a Saturday morning with my kids or something like that, I think that despite the yeah. cul-de-sac design, that would still, you know, you've got the paths, the hiking trails, 22 miles and yeah. all that. I think that's reasonable. Good. But, uh, it's, I mean, that's more, that's, that's suburban residential no. in Texas. Oh, that's so. good, that's good. It's good. It's good. Hey, really good meetings at tension, just like a good story. Okay, the weakest companies, the weakest teams, always have a lot of agreement. That means someone is dominating everything. The best conversation is one that has disagreement and tension. There's a plot. Okay, and so.
so I like the fact that you took a position counter to our project. It makes us say, okay, what? Now I'm going to give you the counter. I'm going to go to my bride. You know, I do this because I haven't talked to her about this. Susan, why do you like cul de sacs? Here you go. So here's a. Here's a <laughs> no, but I'm going to tell you there's a reason why, and she'll answer it. And I don't, and we, we haven't talked about it. She had no, she had no idea. I'm going to do it I just know. 32 years of being married, I know. Okay, what are you going to say about cul de sacs? Well, because I can let the kids go outside and play in the cul de sac, and I can become friends with all my neighbors, and we all gather in the cul de sac, and we. You know, we need community and we need each other when we have small children growing up. Um, so. Yes, yeah, so there's, and so you went at it from an urban planning standpoint and connectivity, and what we find is, and remember who our buyer is. Right. Who's our buyer? Wife, woman. Female buyer, female, ma female buyer, so not a male buyer. So, and then not that, and this is not a, you know, anything other than that's a reality. And so, a mom, is going to be worried about little Johnny and little Susie. And that becomes a huge buying factor. And so, not only do people um, want to live on cul-de-sacs, they pay a lot more money to live on cul-de-sacs. So we get premiums on those cul-de-sacs. But your point is very valid, and that is cul-de-sacs can create dead ends if you're not careful in the whole design process, and you've got to be careful with it. We like short cul-de-sacs, not long ones. Some architects will design these cul-de-sacs that are a mile long. You're like, That's crazy because you can't get out of there, right? And to your point, so we like short cul-de-sacs for that reason, but we like cul-de-sacs because mom, our buyer, she wants little Johnny and Susie safe when she's looking out the door of the house. So there you, there you have logical planning sequence, right, meets consumer demand. So... Thought it was good. Yes, sir. Thank you for doing that. Yes, sir. I mean, good young spot. <laughs> Uh, activation, they went on, they, went, they talked about that. Uh, social events open to the general public, we like that. Um, think of the boardwalk open, we've got a bunch of stuff we'll be doing there. Uh, ethnic and cultural diversity in residents and visitors. We have a very diverse community in, in Town Lake, so this is a great idea, something that we share with our HOA uh, management. Uh, public art, again, uh, like this, bring local artists in. Some of that's kind of germinating already. We really like that idea. Uh, regular cultural events. Um, we talked about that. At the end. One more, Mike. There's one more? Yeah. Hey, before we go to the award, any questions or anything you want to talk about before we wrap this thing up? Then, um, nothing? You ready to be done with this thing? Okay. All right. Okay, so which team will take home the coveted? No, so y'all got to do the. the Come on. Come to look. seriously what you did. And I just first I just want to tell you again, I did a great job. All of it. You did a great job and um, we got some really good feedback and some things we're going to implement. So hopefully in a year when you come back to Town Lake you'll say, hey I was responsible for that idea. Okay. Uh, but the winner is But first folks, it's intermission. Time for us to pop over to Town Lake and buy ourselves our own piece of Texas heaven. Welcome to Town Lake, a master plan community located in the heart of the Cypress Fairfield area on the western edge of Houston, Texas. The development spans over 2,443 acres and takes its name from the 300 acre recreational lake that connects the community, forming the basis of its identity. Incorporating residential development combined with community amenities and mixed use retail, Town Lake welcomes residents and visitors through its careful integration of economic sensitivity, environmental stewardship, community interconnectedness, and sensory experience of place. The eponymous lake 
is the central feature around which this community is built, connecting residents by water to retail, restaurants, fitness centers, and other amenities. Quiet, secluded neighborhoods provide refuge, while open social spaces like the boardwalk, amenity center, and amphitheater create opportunities for social interaction and community development. Adjacent cultural hubs such as the Berry Center and Lone Star College provide a full range of services to residents and visitors. Though significant, economic return is not the only development goal. People desire both built and natural settings for different activities and experiences. The trick is to get the balance right, which was a key consideration for Town Lake's development team. We'll analyze how nature weaves through the community to the long-term benefit of residents and visitors alike. Residents enjoy homes built on or adjacent to the lakefront, all within a stone's throw of water recreation opportunities afforded by private and community boat docks. Visitors also have access to lake amenities, making this development a social and economic destination for members of surrounding communities. A significant draw of the lake is the experience of the water. The tactile combination of warm sunshine and cool lake water on your skin, the refreshing breeze blowing along the shore, kissing your face and delivering freshwater scents, the enjoyable sounds of water lapping at the shore or children splashing in the lake. Throughout the neighborhood, the continuous view of the lake reminds one of place and connects the community as a common social experience. The natural environments of water and green space create a healthy community identity. The significant acreage wisely committed to lake and landscaping set Town Lake apart from many other master plan communities. About a quarter of the zone under development is dedicated to lake surface area and Texas native landscaping coverage which include over 22 miles of trails, seven parks, and a managed aquatic fishery program. The easy access of a well-stocked lake will undoubtedly give the area's fishermen a good excuse to spend hours outdoors practicing their cast. The amphitheater, currently under development, borders the lake and is planned to seat over 3,000 patrons. This cultural hub will serve the community as a venue for all types of artistic events including concerts, theatrical productions, and visiting speakers. The sights and sounds experience at the venue will also foster economic growth, drawing customers to Town Lake retail from the surrounding areas. The resident clubhouse and water park is an additional amenity hub that distinguishes Town Lake from nearby developments. The facility is accessible exclusively to residents and includes separate child and adult fitness centers, meeting spaces, tennis courts, a lazy river, multiple swimming pools, and a sandy beach area right on the lake. The diverse choice of amenities offers children a chance to play and socialize, surrounded by the brightly colored carnival design of the water park. At the same time, adults can re recline nearby, either soaking up the sun or relaxing in the shade, and enjoy a getaway from the hustle and bustle of work life. These amenities enhance the economic value of the development by attracting potential homeowners, especially the young family demographic. Additionally, the upscale lake house can serve as a special event venue for weddings or other memorable occasions. The flexibility of the space ensures that the center will remain relevant to the community and create an active social hub around which residents will garner a sense of collective ownership and community identity. Residents should feel positive about the environmental stewardship of the enhancements as well. Caldwell companies carefully designed the lake house to exceed energy efficiency standards, which allows for lower utility bills. These direct savings are reflected in lower HOA fees when compared with commensurate properties. The boardwalk improvement ties the whole development together. It combines office space, retail fronts, dining options, and live social events to attract residents and guests. Currently under construction, the boardwalk is nestled in a high income district with significant traffic counts, making it poised to be a commercial success. In addition to economic value, the boardwalk social space offers lakeside experiences to guests and residents, titillating all the senses. The sounds of passing conversation, a breeze in the trees, or water lapping at the shore, 
the smells and tastes of restaurants and cafes, a visage of the differentiated and intertwining facades, the feel of breeze off the lake and sunlight filtered through shade trees. Accessible by car, foot, or even boat, the boardwalk solidifies a sense of place and community identity among residents. The environmental features of the boardwalk include Texas native landscaping and locally sourced building materials. This curtails the development's carbon footprint through reduced shipping distance. The landscaping throughout the project benefits from improved efficiency by using the lake itself as an irrigation source. This strategy reduces the environmental impact of greenways and cycles water resources within the community. While the amenities of Town Lake clearly differentiate this place as a grade above the average, the residential units also meet or exceed the standards of surrounding communities. The neighborhood draws a sense of character from diverse architectural veneers and native landscaping styles. Areas such as the 55 and better heritage community foster social connections between like individuals, while gated sections offer safety and security. This review of the holistic value of the Town Lake development find serious competitive advantage in the qualities of sensory experience, environmental sensitivity, social connection, and economic return. It's no wonder this community connected by water boasts numerous awards and is fast becoming a top destination for residents and visitors, both young and old. Now, y'all, don't delay. Pick up your cell phone and ring 281-256-2772. That's 281-256-2772. And tell them, Fred Caldwell and Peter Barnhart, they sent you. And now, we return you to When Fred and Susan Caldwell came to town. Alright. Alright, here we go. And this was selected by a whole group in our company. I want you to know that we actually did spend some time on this. And he spent a lot of time on it, but we had a whole group of us in our development team look at this. And so uh, we took seriously what you did. And I just first I just want to tell you again, I did a great job. All of it. You did a great job, and um, we got some really good feedback. Some things we're going to implement. So hopefully, in a year when you come back to Town Lake, you'll say, "Hey, I was responsible for that idea." Okay. Uh, but the winner is y'all ready? The winner is Team Three. And uh, <laughs> so team three and Fred will present you with each with your awards. Okay. Here we go. So. Chris is the team leader. So Chris, if you want to come over first, Chris. There we go. Congratulations. Yeah. 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 Nice work. Garrett yeah. is on social couple there. Congratulations. Jack is on sensory. Congratulations. Yeah. Stephanie's on economic. And Robert is on color sex. <laughs> Hey guys, what are you doing? Get up here. 
Couldn't get rid of them. I <laughs> always start with the truth. But let, me, let, me, let me give you the parable that goes with it. You're going to have rainy days in life. Okay? You're going to have a lot of days, and you need people around you to have similar umbrellas to walk down the path together. Okay? To encourage you and keep you dry. Because let me tell you, in this business, there's plenty of times when it's raining hard. Really hard. So get people with other umbrellas with you, gather up, be a community that kind of stays out, that can weather the storms, because the storms will come in life. Okay, they're coming down the road. But be a team and you can get through those things together, and there's always blue sky days like we had today. Okay. All right. Wise words. Hard to follow. <laughs> uh, so, the Texas AM University Real Estate Academy Awards. Category Best Developer in Texas. <laughs> Let's get another drum roll. Where is it? <laughs> On behalf of all the students in the Master of Land and Property Development program at Texas A&M University, we'd like to thank Fred Corwell, Susan Corwell, and all the Corwell and Company team that have been so generous in their support of our studies of Town Lake. For those of you that are interested in the Master of Land and Property Development program at Texas A&M University. Uh, remember, it's never too late for your career in real estate. If you'd like to talk to Professor Booth at any time, his cell phone number is 979-393-8111. That's 979-393-8111. This has been a great Southland film production. <laughs>